This is a reply to Rucka, an objectivist YouTuber who makes parodies and humor stuff, but also has some serious discussions on his Rucka Reacts channel. I talked with him a little bit today in his comments on the right. Uh, this is not what his video is actually about, it's just a total side point. But he mentioned using force in retaliation, and I said force should be used in defense. So I wanted to talk a bit about that. This video is going to have several other sections as well afterwards. Um, there will be a table of contents in the description. You can click the timestamps to go to whatever section you want. So I think defense is the only justification for using force. You shouldn't use aggressive force. And I divide all force into those two categories, defensive or aggressive. Rucka seems to have a bit of a different view, which is partly due to Ayn Rand. But I don't think Ayn Rand made a clear statement about this, whereas Rucka seems to think that she agrees with him. But I don't find Rucka's statements completely clear either. I think we agree quite a bit. But, so my view is, if there's no danger to your rights, you shouldn't use force. Rucka says, quote, the purpose of criminal courts is to punish crime. So he's talking about punishment, which I interpret as different than defense. Similarly, I interpret the word retaliate as different than defense. Retaliate means to return the like for, repay or requite in kind, or to put or inflict in return. Those are some dictionary definitions. I think they're pretty normal. So you get the sense of getting someone back, getting revenge, which is a different thing than defending yourself from ongoing threat. So Rucka's questions, though, were to me off topic, because I'm trying to talk about a philosophy principle. And he was asking things like, wouldn't we forgive a murderer who doesn't plan to murder again? And he thought my thinking was similar to leftists who are doing decriminalization and stuff. And he said, if a murderer shows full remorse or was a special one-time murderer, e.g. he killed the man who used to abuse him as a child, he can walk free, question mark. Right, so again, I do not agree with that. I think if someone commits a crime, they're showing themselves to be a dangerous person objectively. We now have objective evidence regarding their danger. Whereas, I think trying to evaluate someone's psychology and predict whether they're going to commit a crime is something the courts should not do. That's very, very hard. Just stay away from that stuff. We don't know how remorseful someone is. They don't know. Introspection is hard. The idea that it's a special one-time murder and he's safe, he's not going to murder anyone else, so it's a special case, like, I don't know, man. If he can commit one murder, maybe he can commit another one. Like, it's hard to fucking know that. So my opinion is, if they've committed a crime, they're showing that they're dangerous, and that's why jail is justified, because they are a dangerous person. Um, and I do not want to evaluate this by the opinion of a court psychologist who thinks, oh, this person is reformed. I think that's ridiculous and not objective. So I'm not trying to shorten jail terms or get people out of jail or anything like that. I'm just saying the purpose of jail is that it protects people. The people in the jail are dangerous. We know that if we let them out, they might harm more people. So we're protecting society. That's the purpose. The purpose is not to punish them in the, in the sense of being cruel or mean to them to get revenge. Um, I'm unaware of a clear statement from Ayn Rand contradicting this. However, she does say things about retaliation, just like Raka. So... It, it's hard to say. I'm going to look at some book quotes soon. So Rucka also asked me, quote, do you disagree with Rand's use of the phrase retaliatory force? As a minor quibble, she didn't use that exact phrase that I can find in a quick search. Um, she used phrases like retaliatory use of force. She used very similar phrases, so it doesn't really change the point. But I don't think she used that exact phrase. But she definitely said stuff about retaliation. Not a lot, though. Um, so let's look at some books about. So we're going to go in Atlas Shrugged and we're going to type in retali. 
and you see there are three hits. The, the term Ritali is in Atlas Shrugged three times, and one of them is highly relevant. It's in Galt's speech. We'll look at that in a bit. But now if we type in some other words like defend, oh, 96 hits. So defense, 39, defend, 47, protect. And this is going to include like protection and protecting, 161. So she talks about defense and protection far more than about retaliation. Uh, but now we're going to look at what she actually says about retaliation. So this is from Galt's speech. So he says, when a man attempts to deal with me by force, I answer him by force. Uh, he doesn't place moral sanction on a murderer's wish to kill him. I completely agree with that. I have no problem with that. Um, I just, I regard that as defending yourself. So it is only retaliation, the, only as retaliation that force may be used and only against the man who starts its use, is what Rand says. So I do not like the term retaliation here. I would not use it. But I think my disagreement with Rand is just about wording. I, it's hard to tell, but that's my guess. She says, uh, I do not share his evil or sink to his concept of morality. I merely grant him his choice, destruction. The only destruction he had the right to choose, his own. So I have no problem with destroying an aggressor. Um, of course, if you can subdue them much more uh, gently and it's still safe you should in general like you don't shoot someone with a gun when you could subdue them without killing them uh, i think we all agree about that it's roughly like the libertarian concept minimum necessary force which i think is misleading and misused but like it's not the wrong principle like you shouldn't be using extra force for no reason but the minimum necessary is often quite a lot because using more minimal force is often riskier. Like you use more force and then there's you win more reliably. It's like safer for you. So that's actually a legitimate reason to use quite a lot of force. Like you don't want to take like a 1% chance of losing the fight just to protect the other guy who's attacking you. But anyways, there are certainly cases where we just subdue someone and we don't kill them. Like we don't kill most of our criminals. So it's not always destruction, but it's destruction if necessary. Anyways, so he uses force to seize a value. I use it only to destroy destruction, right? So if someone is not a further threat, we're not destroying destruction. Uh, this means it has to be defense. If there's no destruction anymore, then, no, then we shouldn't be using force anymore. There's no reason to. Our justification for force is gone. Now, again, it's hard to tell who's a threat. And if someone has committed a crime, that shows they're dangerous. Uh, and that is adequate reason to put them in jail, in general. I'm just saying the principle is that there has to be an actual threat, as far as we know, according to our imperfect knowledge. So she continues, a hold-up man seeks to gain wealth by killing me. I do not grow richer by killing a hold-up man. I seek no values by means of evil, nor do I surrender my values to evil. So her main point here is defending yourself and not being an aggressor. Of course, we both agree with that, no problem. Um, but I think the comment, I seek no values by means of evil, is very important. Like, you're not supposed to gain a value, according to objectivism and Rand, via force. You only use force to defend yourself to prevent losing your values, but you're not using force in order to gain values. Now, Rucka said, uh, he said something about justice, actually, I think it's here. Uh, but isn't justice the point of prosecuting criminals? Now, justice to me sounds like a positive value. And Rand says we do not get positive values from force. So if justice is a positive value, then according to Rand, we shouldn't be trying to get it via force. We have to get it in other ways. That makes sense to me. Uh, so then I was going to look at these other books a little bit. Uh, capitalism and Virtue of Selfishness both had relevant material which I only skimmed briefly. I haven't really read it before. Uh, I haven't, like I've read these books before, but I didn't review exactly what she said before making the video. So we'll see. I'm gonna go to the beginning and then search. So there's 11. 
11 hits on capitalism. It looked at a glance like she was just saying similar things to Alice Shrug, but we'll see. All right, so she says the government acts as the agent of man's self-defense. So when, to me, that means uh, all the government force has to be defensive force, not aggressive force. I, I find Rucka's position unclear on, like, is there a third type of force that's not defense, but also not aggression? Like, what type of force is that? Like, the force of justice or something? Or, like, not minimum necessary defensive force, but it's still justified? I'm not sure exactly. And I don't think that's something that Rand detailed either. And it may, but right here, she says self-defense, and then in the same sentence, she says retaliation. Uh, it's possible that... You know, I should really look this up because I've I've had issues before where Rand uses words in older meanings. It came up with the word permit, which she used in an older sense of the word, and someone misread it. So I'm going to look up retaliate in like a bunch of dictionaries and see if we find anything notable that might help explain this. Oh, let's relate. I spelled it wrong. All right. Re retaliate. There we go. Make an attack or assault in return for a similar attack. See, that's just the kind of thing that sounds wrong to me. And then it says archaic, repay in kind. But this sounds like eye for an eye, which is the thing I'm disagreeing with. Because I don't think defense should be mixed up with revenge. I think this is the dictionary definition I already gave earlier. Here's an older one. Well, same thing. Same thing. And they're all about the same. Let's try the OED. Now these are all the same. Anyway, so I just I disagree with their wording here. Um Only in retaliation and only against initiators. She sort of seems to use retaliation as like a synonym for defense. Because nothing other than the word retaliation seems to say anything about to punish them or to get them back or an eye for an eye. Like... There's none of that. It's just the one word retaliation that suggests it. And you can see what she's against, like pacifism, which of course I'm, I agree with her on that. We've got to defend ourselves. We've got to be willing to use force to put people in jail and so on. Otherwise, they'll destroy us. That's the purpose here is to prevent us from being destroyed, to destroy destruction. Not to... So there's other issues that make it more complicated um, that I think are interesting. Like there's the deterrence issue. If you have a policy of putting people in jail for certain things, some people will not do it in the first place because they know about this policy. So it deters some people. I regard that as a defensive purpose. Like you're following your general policy because it reduces crime. It prevents some assaults from happening or whatever. But like you can see uh, how people would mix that up with justice or punishment. And they're saying, well, you have to punish them or other people will do it. And it's like, that's a reasonable wording, but you philosophically, I think that falls under defense because there's a defensive purpose to it. Like, if it's both defensive and something else, I'm okay with that. It's only if it's not defense. If hypothetically, clearly, there's no defensive purpose to this force, then I don't think you should use it. But if it's like for the purposes of defense and justice or whatever, then it's okay. Although I, I do question trying to seek any positive value with force, like justice. I, I think it makes more sense to see yourself getting justice from... Uh, like people's moral judgments of the crime and 
the like social delegitimization of the criminal and stuff like that. Like there's a sort of a justice and people having the right opinion of it and pronouncing appropriate judgments and so on. But like the actual act of like locking the guy up um, is not like a, a thinking act. It's not about reasoning about justice and crime and punishment and so on. Anyways, Rand goes on. Uh, she doesn't want to leave force at the discretion of individual citizens because then everyone's going to be worried about their neighbors. So she doesn't want, like, anarchy. So you need things like objective rules of evidence. This is not talking about the issue of whether the purpose of force is to punish people or to get justice or something or just for defense. But she does talk about defense a lot and not about those other things. And then we're going to look at virtue of selfishness. Go to the top. All right. So yes, the, the reason she says retaliation is necessary is it's the difference between murder and self-defense. So she just seems to treat retaliation and defense as basically the same thing. So I don't see how you could take that as clearly her disagreeing with my it has to be defense viewpoint. I'll only grant that there's some ambiguity there. Anyways, and she makes the point again that you're not you're not gaining values from people using force. Anyway, she says the only moral purpose of government is to protect man's rights, which means protect him from physical violence. So this means it has to be protection. Like that's how I read that. The, the government's actions, the courts, the police, etc., are to protect us. If it's doing something that's not doesn't have a protective function, then it should stop doing it. Basically. Uh, so I read that as agreeing with me. Like that's the basic principle, I think. And stuff about pacifism again. I wonder if it's like the same essay. It looked very similar. Anyways. All right. So that is the retaliation stuff. So now I'm going to move on to my opinion of Rucka while I'm talking about him. So I'm not a fan of his parodies and humor stuff. I wanted to say that because he had a big falling out with Charles too, who pretended to be a fan of that stuff and then uh, smeared Rucka for it and insulted him and attacked him over it. Uh, so I'm just, I'm not that interested in that stuff. I'm more interested in Rucka when he talks about ideas by himself. I also am less interested in his chats with other people. That's just my impression is I found them less interesting. Whereas when Rucka tries to explain an idea, like his view on the gun stuff, I found that more interesting. Oh yeah, so I was going to talk about the gun stuff to the actual topic of the video a bit. So Rucka says that some guns, like machine guns and tanks and bazookas, are unnecessary for emergency self-defense. Like, they're too powerful. They're excessive force for that purpose. And therefore, like, why would someone have them other than to maybe do aggression with them? And therefore, people shouldn't be able to have them. And to talk about that, he goes into property rights stuff. That I, I thought was interesting, like, because he's going into the ph philosophical theory, and I agreed with a lot of that. So I think there are reasons to want to own a tank or a bazooka or whatever, other than aggression. You can be a hobbyist, you can be an engineer who's interested in like machines and stuff. Um, you can have a gun range on your giant property where you bring your rich friends to play around. Like there, there can be fun gotten from these things. Uh, you might want to retrofit fit a tank and like get rid of the guns and make a aquatic or something like that could be cool. There's various purposes that could be involved here. Uh, and there are various dangers. So there is the danger that the person's going to misuse it and they're dangerous. Uh, 
So I think that applies to nuclear weapons, for example. Like, I would not trust my neighbor with a nuclear weapon. I think a nuclear weapon is such a major threat that it has to be under, like, very serious security and controls uh, so that terrorists don't come steal it and set it off, so that criminals can't get to it, and so that the people who are in control of it don't misuse it. Like, there have to be checks and balances and backup procedures and, like, chains of command and ways to overrule the guy in charge because you don't want one guy to go crazy and set off the nuke. Like, there has to be a whole system involving multiple people so there's more redundancy and reliability because nukes are so dangerous. Um, a tank is not nearly as dangerous, but it's quite dangerous, maybe. I'm really not an expert. So I was thinking, like, a tank might be able to do quite a lot of damage that the police couldn't really stop it and the time for the military to come stop it might, like, take too long. So it could go on like quite a rampage. So maybe there's like a huge danger there and uh, it's just too dangerous to like have one in the city. I'm not sure, but that's plausible to me. But Rucka was also making similar points about like machine guns and I assume bazookas. I don't think he used that example, which are like something that you could do a decent amount of damage with, but the police could probably stop you. And my thoughts on that are I don't think there's like a huge safety issue with people having those things. And I think like freedom is important and we should have a lot of scope to defend ourselves instead of having to rely on the government and the police uh, like arriving on time. Like I don't like our fate being in the hands of the authorities and just rely on them. Like I think self-reliance is a really important value that not that you should necessarily do it most of the time, but having the option I think is important because sometimes the government lets you down. Um, so it's important that you can take your life into your own hands and that that's not suppressed and banned. And there's other reasons too, like the constitution and what if our government becomes tyrannical and blah, 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 but those are not my primary concerns, but I think they do matter. Anyways, So I think I'm more favorable to gun rights and stuff than Rucka is. So those are just some thoughts about that. Uh, then I wanted to look at my article uh, called Liberalism, Reason, Peace, and Property. So this is an overview of some of the theory. This is very like inspired by objectivism, similar to objectivism. And when I was watching Rucka's video, it reminded me of my article. There were some major similarities and mostly in the first like five minutes of his video where he was talking about uh, property rights and like philosophy. So I say that there's two main freedoms, the freedom to think and the freedom to live and that they combine into the freedom to live according to your ideas, and that this should be granted to every individual. So uh, to have a rational, successful life, I say that you need free control over your body, free control over your property, and you need to be free to deal with nature. So basically you need to be able to live by your ideas, and to do that, for your ideas to have control over physical reality, you need to control physical objects, such as not only your body, your body, but your tools, your property, the things you create. And that is what enables you to deal with, to translate these ideas in your mind into this control over physical reality and dealing with the world around you. You do that through your body, your hands, your tools, your property. Um, and that is why you need property rights. Uh, the article then goes through, uh, talks about violence being bad, force being bad, uh, trade being good, limited government, peace, harmony of interests, stuff like that. Uh, common classical liberalist and objectivist themes. All right. So my general opinion of Rucka is I like that he is an objectivist thinker who cares about ideas and takes ideas seriously. I find some of his content worth watching and interesting. There aren't enough people in that category that I think just make things that are good enough to watch. 
So that is why I tried talking with him a little and I watched some of his stuff. One of the topics Rucka talked about uh, maybe a couple months ago that I remember was deplatforming. And we disagree about this, but I found his comments interesting and worthwhile. So he was disagreeing with Ben Shapiro and various other people. And I think he's basically right. Like, they're idiots. Their positions are bad. Um, they want new regulations. And they say this shit about a publisher versus platform. You can either be a platform where you have, like, no moderation and just anarchy. Or if you have, like, any moderation at all, you're a publisher. And now you're responsible for everything. And it's just a completely terrible idea that makes no sense and would shut down all the forums. And they're looking for new regulations. They want the government to get involved and help them out. Um, you know, the left is oppressing us, so they run to the government. So I agree with Rucka that that's bad, but then I have some further thoughts. So I say, first of all, that this bias problem, the deplatforming, the way Google and Facebook and so on are anti-right wing, that's a real problem there. Like, people are complaining for good reason. Their solutions are often pretty shitty. But there's something worth complaining about that we should be looking for solutions. The solution is not to just say, oh, well, they're private companies, therefore it's not censorship and they can do whatever they want. The end. Like, there, there's something to deal with here. So we should look for peaceful solutions, not new regulations and new government overreach. Um, and so one of the things you can do is you can, you know, start a new platform and you can talk to your friends and you can argue your reasoning why deplatforming is bad and those things are fine and good and valuable um, but also my thinking is we should look at what would a classical liberal country do what would a minarchist state do what would a night watchman state do would it do anything or would it act would would any of its laws be violated like never mind new regulations what about the regulations we already have and not just any regulation but the regulations we actually should have like are they violating any laws that we already have that are good laws? Uh, and my answer to that is yes. I, I think that there's clearly some fraud going on in the form of false advertising. They have advertised a lot of these companies quite clearly and publicly saying things about how they support free speech, how they have unbiased moderators. Um, and information has come out from Pro Project Veritas and other sources that they have been lying. Uh, and when you lie to your users, you lie to the public, you lie to the people using your product, that is false advertising and that is fraud and that is prohibited in an objectivist state. So I think the government ought to enforce the basic laws and do its job of protecting people from force. Which of course has nothing to do with the publisher platform distinction and doesn't require new regulations. Um, it reminds me a little bit of immigration because... Um, a lot of people are like talking about let's make new laws against immigrants blah 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 or new laws to protect our borders and there's no need for that there's plenty of laws already on the books that just have to be enforced uh, and so for this topic i wrote uh, an article called deplatforming and fraud and i wrote fraud and big companies supporting fraud and there's some links to some details and stuff this will be in the youtube description if you want to read it all right, next up. So Charles Tu is an objectivist YouTuber who was friends with Rock and was giving him some like philosophy advice and ideas and stuff. Uh, but then Charles Tu turned on Rock and attacked him and made a total ass of himself. Uh, he was completely unreasonable. I really liked Rucka's reply videos. I thought he did a good job of highlighting that Tu was in the wrong. Uh, I also was interested in Charles Tu because uh, like Rucka, I noticed that Tu was an objectivist who knew some stuff. He had some good points. He made some good videos. Um, he's got some fire to him. He's He makes strong points, but he's right a lot. Like, he has some good thinking and good ideas. Uh, that's notable. There's not enough of that. So I was interested in him, too. However, uh, Tu attacked me as well. And Tu did that before I knew he existed. Uh, he found me first, and he flamed me in a podcast without saying my name and without quoting me. And never told me, never notified me. He didn't... So it was quite, like, lame and cowardly, or I don't know what it was, but he wouldn't 
you know, engage in an actual debate of ideas with me. He just attacked me and then ignored me when I found out about him and I tried to contact him. I wrote a letter to him because we had some stuff in common and also some disagreements. But anyways, and he just ignored me because he was already mad at me from this previous thing that we'd never had any discussion whatsoever about. And he wouldn't even tell me. So that was really lame. He also later, uh, I went on his Discord and he banned me and flamed me. So I'm going to just quickly show quotes for that. So here's the video with the timestamp of where he talks about me a while back. Uh, he calls my writings poorly written and dumb and so profoundly mistaken, but he doesn't name me. Is that cowardice? Is that a favor? Is he protecting me? I like, I do not want the favor. I want my ideas to be quoted and attributed. Does he not want people to read what I actually said and judge for themselves? Uh, he attacks a short, misleading statement of what I think with no quoting and no apparent attempt to understand what I meant in context. And you can hear him laughing at me. Um, the topic, by the way, is Karl Popper stuff. I have some ideas that disagree with objectivism about epistemology. And his reaction to that is just to basically be hateful and not consider like arguing his point. And then after I got banned from the Discord, someone asked him why I was banned. So he did not give any explanation to me, but after I was gone, someone pasted me what he said, which was, I banned him and deleted all his comments. I recognized him. He's a laughable charlatan. His stupidity is amusing and innocuous to anyone who isn't an idiot, but it would be wrong for me to allow him to make a fool of himself and drag down the level of conversation here just so I could amuse myself. Um, I thought this was quite mean. I did not think it was honest. Uh, judge for yourself, I guess. Uh, note the total lack of arguments or evidence. All right, so at the end, find me at elliottemple.com. Link will be in the description. Uh, for an overview of my ideas, I've got a video you can watch and uh, for objectivist people, I figure there'll be a lot of you watching. I've done close readings of Alice Shrugged. So they look like this, where I have quite a few book quotes. All the yellows are quotes, and I do a lot of detailed analysis. This is just chapter one right here. Scrolling, scrolling some more. So yeah, if you want detailed discussion of Alice Shrugged, uh, that may interest you. Here's what ElliotTemple.com looks like. I have Several websites, a newsletter, uh, YouTube, podcast, Twitter, ebooks. I have a bunch of essays on websites. And yeah, overview of fallible ideas philosophy, video explains various things, I think, if you're interested. Uh, yeah, so please like and subscribe. Liking helps more people see it, it shows up more in the search algorithms. Bye.